Um, so, uh, very excited and grateful, as I'm sure you all are, to have these experts joining us today. I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll learn a great deal and hopefully go back to our jobs with fresh insights and maybe some new inspiration. Um, so just to set the stage, uh, the idea for this webinar came about because we ran, Percuto Plus Merge ran a user survey in collaboration with Adobe earlier that this year. Um, and in that survey, we asked a whole series of questions to try to better understand how Marketo users are leveraging the platform, what are their priorities, what are their challenges, um, and a recurring theme in the data that was collected is how widespread and complex the challenge of measuring impact and marketing attribution is, um, and how much teams are kind of struggling to align their people, processes, and technologies around that goal. So um, we wanted to dig deeper on why proving impact is such a challenge and discuss how teams can start solving it with the experts that we've invited today. Um, one last ask for the chat before we get started. I'm sure that you all registered for this webinar because you have your own personal team struggles with measuring impact. So maybe uh, ask that question now and we'll make sure to get to it at the end of the webinar where we have reserved time to answer audience questions. Um, if you also have any questions or thoughts that pop up as we are going through our discussion, please don't be shy. Please post in the webinar. And um, my colleague, Lindsay, who's on the call as well, will be compiling them so that we can make sure to get your questions answered. Uh, without further ado, let's quickly introduce our panelists, even though like they probably do not require much of an introduction. And then we'll jump into the questions. All right, let's go. Amy. All right, I guess I'm up first. Benefit of having a name that starts with an A. I'm Amy Goldfein. <laughs> I'm the head of marketing ops at Iterable, based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also the founder of marketingopsadvice.com, a site for marketing ops professionals to get technical, strategic, and career advice. And my pronouns are she, her. Great. I'm Brooke Bartos. I lead the marketing ops and analytics divisions of Invoice Cloud and Engage Smart. So we're a Boston area fintech in the digital payment space. Uh, as you heard, I started using Marketo in about 2014. Uh, and prior to my current role, I spent a uh, little over three years in consulting uh, for marketing operations and automation with a focus on late stage startups, high growth companies, uh, and some global enterprise brands. So a lot of my experience spreads uh, a little across the map and across several different marketing automation platforms and other tools. Um, I am here in Chicago, so if you are a Marketo user, I lead the Chicago Marketo users group as well as the Microsoft Dynamics users group, and my pronouns are she and her. Daryl. Hey, everyone. I'm Daryl Alfonso. I lead marketing operations at AWS. Um, I'm also, sorry for the shameless plug, a recent author. My book, The Martech Handbook, is available now wherever books are sold. So check it out if you are interested in learning about MarTech. Um, I did want to call out too, I, I think that the other panelists will agree that um, even though it's a Marketo survey, I found that the questions and the results were widely applicable across different marketing automation platforms too. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't super specific. I think it was uh, challenges that all of us in marketing ops are facing. So I'm excited to talk about those. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's me. My pronouns are he, him. Thank you, Jessica. Hey, everyone. I'm Jessica Myers. I'm the Director of Marketing Ops and Technology at Tebra, formerly Patient Pop. Uh, we're an LA area healthcare tech company. Um, prior to my in-house role here at Tebra, um, still adjusting to the new name, I was a consultant for many years in the Marketo space. Uh, Daryl, you took the words out of my mouth. I think in my current role, I oversee two entire technology platforms and found a lot of the questions really relevant to the side of my business that is still leveraging um, a different marketing automation tool. And my pronouns are she, her. Thank you. Paul. Hey, everybody. Uh, name is Paul Ferrer. I am a senior technical consultant here at Percuto Plus Merge. Um, as I said before, I started working with Marketo in 2018 as a support engineer for Marketo and then very quickly Adobe. Uh, and then uh, I've been at Percuto after that. And I work a lot in integrations and some of the more complex problems we try and solve for our clients here at Percuto. 
Um, excited to be here and my pronouns are he and him. Thank you. All right. Well, let's jump right into it. Let's hear what these wonderful people have to say. Um, so really, well, there's only four questions because as you can see, we're a full house and we want to go pretty deep on each of these discussions. So let's look at the uh, survey findings that are fueling this first question. So one of the things we asked in our survey is what users consider their greatest operational weakness. Um, we are able to, so we see here a list of the highest ranked challenges um, across the board. At the top is measuring impact, and it's followed by several other reported weaknesses that are probably somewhat linked to that top one, things like resourcing talent, alignment to goals and strategies, lack of communication and collaboration, measure, measuring work efficiency. So let's unpack that a bit in this first question. Why is measuring impact such a challenge? I know there's a lot of dimensions to this question, and I think each of you are bringing a different one to it, but let's get started with Brooke. Yeah, I think this is sort of a, a twofold answer. Um, there's certainly the dirty data piece that we all deal with. Dirty data, incomplete data, uh, data that needs to be refreshed, that certainly makes this a struggle. I think the other piece that comes with measuring impact, though, is tied to the alignment piece. What are we defining in impact? What are we looking to measure? What is important? And are we really getting lost in a tangle of marketing is trying to measure one thing, sales apps is trying to measure one thing, sales is trying to measure another thing, and we don't have definitions that align? Um, you know, it's it's really hard to say, hey, what is our impact on MQLs or lead generation if we don't have a standardized definition across our organization of what defines an MQL or mm -hmm. a sales accepted or sales qualified lead. And so I think in a lot of cases, measuring impact simply gets bogged down in the fact that there's just a muddy water pool that everybody's trying to look into to pull out the insights that they're looking for without mm -hmm. talking to each other about what that actually means. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. Mm -hmm. And how do you, I guess, to add, how do you sort of address that muddy water problem in your team? Yeah, I think the biggest focus is really the sales and marketing alignment. Um, mm -hmm. So for us internally, we have a biweekly top of funnel meeting where our team sit and we talk about, hey, what's coming in in terms of leads, what's sitting on the shelf, what's moving into the pipeline mm -hmm. and what's happening there so that we can keep our teams in line about what these different definitions mean. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we brought in things, of course, like an attribution tool. Uh, we have a data science and analytics team. We're working on moving things to a data warehouse so that we can get a better understanding. Now that we've started to come to agreement on what these, what these definitions are or what we're looking at and how we are defining business impact, mm -hmm. now we can work on continuing the refinement of the actual measurement of it because we have that definition clear from the get-go. Well, that's great. Yeah, sales marketing alignment for sure. Everyone pays lip service to it, but very difficult to accomplish. Yeah. Um, I want to ask Daryl for his take on this question next, because I know that when I asked him that question initially, he was like, I think it's flawed to begin with. So I think his take is really interesting. Right. So, okay. So I, to be fair, I think I read this question incorrectly. So oh. that's kind of funny, <laughs> but I will, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two things. One thing is I think in terms of the question of why measuring marketing's impact and why mm -hmm. is that hard i think that there's a lot of ambiguity between what everything means you know what does uh marketing generated pipeline mean what does marketing influence pipeline mean um what's a marketing qualified lead is it really qualified or not um a lot of people think it's not so um, I think that there's incredible ambiguity across the organization and people don't really know uh, what's going on. So, so they don't have a lot of trust in the data that the reports show. Um, I also mm -hmm. think that, and I'm, I don't think it's the case for anyone on the call, but a lot of marketers try to claim credit versus trying to create value, right? They mm -hmm. try to say, oh, we're doing a great job, but, you know, and, and they put all this effort into a, a uh, you know, showing or trying to demonstrate that they're that they're providing value. So, so that's how I answer that question. My what I originally thought that this question was is why is why is it hard to measure marketing ops impact? Oh. Um, and and that's the question that I thought wasn't really a valid one because you mm -hmm. know 
I think that, you know, my view has always been with that analogy that marketing ops is like the pit crew, you know, the, in, in a, in a, in a racetrack, right. Mm -hmm. The, the, the race car is going around and round and it has to stop periodically to change out the tires, change the fuel, check the engine. Right. So it's very much a team. So, so to say, Hey, what's the value of marketing ops? It's kind of like to say, what's the value of that pit crew, right? You need both of them to win. So mm -hmm. I, I, was almost offended by that question, but <laughs> so that's why I had like a hot take on it. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's kind of the way that that I view that question. That's understandable, and I do agree. That's an interesting point. That if if people are asking the question like, why is measuring the impact of MOPS so hard? You've already kind of lost this because you're already kind of questioning the value of operationalizing, right? Which I think is a really interesting perspective. Um, speaking of the value of operationalizing, I feel like Amy's answer to this question will cover a lot of broad ground around that topic. So. Yeah. Um, first of all, I love that pit crew analogy. Um, this is why I love talking to other people in my field. I feel like I get these really great analogies and metaphors, which I am terrible at and usually bungle when I try to um, reiterate them. So I'm going to try really hard not to use any metaphors um, in this. But if I do, just uh, bear with me because, again, we're live. So, um, you know, I think what's really hard is, like Brooke said, the data is a mess and there's not enough budget, and not enough time. Like, most marketing teams and marketing ops teams are under resourced and they're like just trying to keep the lights on especially like if you want to like do detailed analysis you want to implement an attribution tool or you want to set up opportunity source reporting or you want to like spend deep time looking at your know, roi um you have to have the time and you have to have the money and you have to think of the opportunity costs of what you're going to not be doing. And if you're a small team and you're just trying to get campaigns out the door and you're trying to keep your Marketo Salesforce staying healthy and, you know, trying to onboard new team members, like you just don't have the bandwidth for that. And like, that's okay. When you think about like the four pillars of marketing ops, like you usually start with platform ops and then campaign ops and then analytics. And like, if you don't have time to do the first two, you just don't have time to do the third. Um, I think mm -hmm. also like agreeing on how you're going to measure it is so, so hard. You have to have agreement across marketing and sales, whether you're looking at multi-touch attribution, where you're just looking at marketing influence, basically comparing marketing to marketing. If you're trying to tie ROI into that, if you, or like, if you're trying to actually have swim lanes where you're saying this opportunity is marketing source. This one is sales source. This one is BD source, like trying to get alignment on that, like good luck. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that's really hard, um, you know, and, and so just, um, you know, knowing, knowing what you're going to measure is, and you know, knowing, for example, like what your um, life cycle stages are, trying to get agreement on that can be really challenging. And then at, to Brooke's point, do you even have the data to measure what you want to measure? We were going through this process and they wanted to measure a stage, I think a marketing engage stage. And I'm like, yeah, we don't have the data. To, <laughs> I don't know. We don't have the data to get to that. So yeah, um, quite, quite a few challenges there for sure. Yeah. And I think an interesting thing you touched on, Amy, is the fact that like, not only do we have to agree on what's being measured, but you also need to be able to find the data. And I think our... Yeah. Our consultant, Paul, who's on this call, um, has, because he gets to see a breadth of different clients, has seen that data, silo data siloing issue um, in many different instances. So, Paul, do you want to jump in and share perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that's been mentioned so far, spot on. We see it a lot. Uh, all my coworkers can definitely also say that they've seen it. And, I mean, the problems don't necessarily stop there because you have you know, the issues of alignment and definitions and just those basic pieces. But then once you actually have alignment, um, you can run into some more in-depth issues, like when you're taking your data and you're actually analyzing it and you're comparing um, the, the stats. If you just look at those stats without context, it's, it's fairly meaningless. Um, you can look at an open rate or you know, engagement and say, oh, that's great. What does that mean? So you need to make sure you're actually comparing it with industry benchmarks and KPIs across the industry and also uh, past performance because you know maybe you're not at the industry benchmark, but if you're doing better than the previous year, that's great. Um, and even making note 
um, within the year of seasonality. We all know, you know, winters and sometimes the summer can be a little slow. So why compare the busy season to then? Make sure you're comparing different uh, each season to the the season um, or the relevant season before, and making sure you're not, um, you know, taking those uh, those that data and looking at it out of context. Um, another thing we see is a lot of just you have the data and just looking at it and saying, great, our database grew. Um, did it grow in a meaningful way? Are those actually engaged records who are engaging with your content? Or are they just rows in your database that are going to sit there and never open anything, never look at emails, never interact with content? So it's mm -hmm. important to have context even once you've made the definitions and aligned with sales and made all those important steps ahead of time. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Uh, we're going to end with Jessica. I feel like she kind of has a refreshing perspective on these, uh, you know, the, this, it's very complex measuring impact, but I think it can be also very simple in, in a way. And I think Jessica has an interesting take on that. Yeah, I um, really echo the comments of all the previous panelists. I think they all had thought threads that I definitely went down when chatting through this question with me and Vivian earlier. Um, <clears throat> I want to mm -hmm. add one thing that maybe I didn't prepare for based on kind of some, some of the other panelists comments. And I think oh, one yeah. thing that is really challenging for a lot of teams is data literacy. Mm -hmm. um, I think you all touched on a number of really interesting terms and sometimes measuring database growth or MQLs is just put out there as a metric and translating that to what does that mean for the actual business is a step that sometimes can get a little lost and I think is particularly important. Um, what I think all of what the panelists kind of touched on really boils down to how can I empower my marketing team to do more of what matters and do less of what doesn't drive um, actual business growth. And if I can, you know, one takeaway is if you can share a piece of analysis that helps your team focus on something that's that's driving what matters and that's going to be unique to you and your business, that's definitely a really meaningful place to start from a proving impact standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's super right. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, Vin. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, I, I just I agree with Jessica. That's like all what it comes back to, right? Like, should they be doing, you know, what what can they do more of? It doesn't really, I don't know, we get so hung up on attribution models and swim lanes and lead sourcing. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, if you think about the way your data is architected, like we're, you know, we use Salesforce campaigns to track pretty much one to one with our Marketo programs. And my um, CMO said to me, well, this is not helpful because you telling me that demo requests are, dri are the number one driver of opportunities is not helpful because I need to know what's driving the demo requests. I was mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, good point. <laughs> so we're trying to, you know, we're using with working with our, you know, I'm lucky we have a sophisticated BI team and a BI tool and, um, you know, analysts that can kind of pull the UTMs that are driving. And we've we're forward thinking enough to apply UTMs to the campaign members so we can get that visibility. But if we didn't, I mean, we've been, I wasn't the one who came up with that. We were doing that before I started. So if we didn't have that, we'd kind of have to figure out backwards how to tie that together to make, so make sure you're looking at the right thing because she's totally right. Like saying that demos are driving, you know, especially for our like lower market segments. Yeah, of course, duh. If they weren't actually, that would be a problem. But okay, they are. So how do you drive more demos? Is really the next question. Mm -hmm. well, and then drive less of the things that maybe aren't performing as well down yeah. the funnel. Kind of a trade-off there is I think often overlooked as well. Well, before we move on to the next question, any final words from any of our panelists that about the discussion that we just had? Um, any final comments? No? Okay. Well, let's move on to question two. Thank you for all your answers. Um, so this, this question two is based around this other question we asked in our survey. Um, the question that was asked was, is your organization more focused on effectiveness or efficiency? So just to clarify a bit, by effectiveness here, we were referring to getting results, impact, really like the end goal of what your campaigns are aiming to accomplish, right? Clicks, conversions, closed deals. Uh, when we say efficiency, we mean how productively, how productively are you able to marshal your resources towards these goals? How quickly and smoothly are things being done? 
Um, but I think um, as we delve into our discussion, uh, it's actually a lot more nuanced than that. So um, let's get started with Jessica, since she ended up last, last time. Um, what should teams be prioritizing, efficiency or effectiveness? I loved this question. Um, as we kind of dug into the meat, I think initially when I participated in the survey, I spent time sitting it and thinking at this question, and I wanted the both option, uh, because I think they're both so important and such a key indicator for teams, um, really for me it comes down to effectiveness. Um, and I think this came out of some conversations with other panelists. You can be the most smooth, well-oiled campaign ops machine in the entire universe and be incredibly efficient at cranking out campaigns. Um, but if those campaigns aren't effective at those downstream metrics that matter, think, how do I get more demo requests? Um, efficiency, frankly, doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'd rather take longer to build a really effective campaign than take shorter to build something that, that doesn't produce anything. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Paul, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Because I know that you might have a, diff a slightly different answer. I have, yeah, I have a, a little bit of a contrasting opinion, um, but I want to put a pretty big disclaimer in front where I'm not saying he should be sending out garbage, right? I think things <laughs> should still be done well and no one no one would make the case that it's okay to put out, you know, content or uh, campaigns or, you know, other things that, that don't meet the expectations you should have. Um, that being said, I think from the process standpoint, uh, efficiency can definitely be better than effectiveness. So, you know, you're at Percuto, uh, as consultants, we do a lot of the same things um, over and over again, and the other consultants on the, on the call will know. Um, so when you have that ability to look at this, uh, you know, task or process or um, system that you've built over and over and over again, um, you are able to make small adjustments and improvements every time. And so as you go through, um, you know, each time it's going to get better and better and better. And you're gaining those improvements because you're able to go and do them at scale. You're able to do them efficient, efficiently. And so you get those incremental improvements naturally out of the efficiency that you have as an agency. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what do you think, Amy, of the above two answers? Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one, right? But I think the more efficient you are, the more effective that you can be, um, you know, and being efficient requires, you know, really good platform ops and really good campaign ops. So you need to make sure that your platforms are set up well, that they're integrated, that they're optimized. When you're talking about Marketo, you want to make sure you have program templates. You want to make sure that your operational programs are clean. Um, you know, that your Marketo Salesforce sync is, is clean um, and that you have for campaign ops, that you have a center of excellence, whatever that means to your company, um, whether that's centralized or decentralized, and I'm not getting into that argument right now. Um, but, you know, where regardless, you need those program templates with tokens, you need, um, uh, you know, an intake process, you need SLAs, you need training, you need QA, you need all of that. Um, and uh, I have a colleague who has a really great quote. Um, they're actually not even in marketing ops. It's somebody from security engineering, but they said, you can't go fast on poorly paved roads. And mm -hmm. I just like, that really like resonated with my mop's heart like, so well. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have an example of when I was able to combine efficiency and effectiveness. Um, I was at a company where we had a very complicated webinar process. It was a really well-oiled machine, but it was like a six weeks. I had a lucid chart about like all the different things and the swim lanes and who did what. Everybody knew what their baton pass was um, and we got really good at it. And then we came in one morning and there had been a media event over the weekend that was relevant to our industry. And my boss said, we're doing a webinar on Thursday. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> Three days from now? She's like, yes, but a, because we prioritized and dropped everything, but B, because we had, we knew, everybody knew their thing. Everybody was hyper-focused. We spun up a registration page in three hours. We got our first 
email out the next morning. We had three times the number of registrants and we still had a good, I think we had like 38% attendance rate, which was our standard. And it was a huge event for us. And it was like, there was no way we could have been that effective without first building the efficiency machine beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing example of that. Um, I'm going to ask Brooke next. I don't know if you're, you feel comfortable addressing this right now, but when I spoke to you earlier, Brooke, you had kind of put the emphasis on the importance of looking at your team structure and skill set when thinking about this question. I don't know if you want to speak to that right now or just share any perspective you have. Um, Amy, ever so slightly touched on that with the, is your team centralized, decentralized, outsourced, and what is the mindset and skill set of the members of your team? If you have people that are able to think about processes and think with that operational mindset, the efficiency piece will come. I think I lean a lot with Jessica on the effectiveness is the part where I tend to prioritize because I think you can effectively launch campaigns that may be inefficient time-wise, but if you're able to get that impact out of it, the investment of the time can be worth it. If you are efficiently launching campaigns that are kind of a mess, maybe they're not effective, they're not getting what you're doing or getting what you want out of them, they're not able to get the impact, or they're not tracked appropriately, you can scale to disaster and in some ways run things completely off the rails if you're not thinking about it from that perspective. Um, so it's it certainly requires having the skill set and the mindset within your team to think about process and effectiveness while you're working on the efficiency. If you can get the efficiency down, it's a lot easier to scale it. Mm -hmm. that, I, that very evocative, the use of the term scaling to disaster, very terrifying. <laughs> um, yeah. Question, has anyone in their own experience or heard from other people examples of scaling to disaster, maybe cautionary tales? That's kind of a out of nowhere question. So it's okay if no one can think of anything right now. I think I've had it where I worked at an organization that when I came in, they were still in this really like scrappy mindset. I think you see this a lot in these like pre-IPO when companies are. Oh, my. Oh, did you cut out? Can you guys hear me? Sorry, am I there? Oh, oh cool. Well, hi. Yeah. I'll repeat myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so I think when you have companies that are scaling when you're going from like early stage to maybe like later stage startup, you mm -hmm. know, you come in, you have people who are used to doing things really scrappily. Maybe they didn't have, weren't used to having marketing automation platform. They weren't used to having marketing ops and they're really effective. They're running like, you know, I was working in an organization they were running really great, like direct mail and doing really cr crazy creative stuff that I could never come up with and like had really great customer experiences, but they were so used to doing things scrappily that they didn't even stop to think if there was a better way to do it. And there was mm -hmm. something where they were taking like people from a Salesforce report and like manually copying them into a spreadsheet. <laughs> and I was like, mm -hmm. well, stop, stop. I got G connector. Take me like, five minutes and I could have this refresh every hour for you. So it's like, I think, you know, it's great when people have growth mindset, but then you also need them to have that switch to that mindset of like, is there a better way for me to do this? You know? And I think sometimes like, you know, they under, they know that we're busy, but like, I love being able, like, it's really fun for me to go in and like jump in. I'm like, oh, let me, let me help you do this better. So I think there's like a little bit of a mindset shift and it, it takes a, takes some like trust building. Um, but you can, you can certainly shift that. Hmm. That's a great example. Um, and Amanda said, usually when someone says we're scrappy, that's a red flag. Yes. It's, 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 uh, it should not be at, at a certain point. It shouldn't be a point of pride. Mm, oh, whoops, let me just go back because we still have to ask Daryl for his take on this. Um, Daryl, what are your thoughts on effectiveness versus efficiency? Yeah, so, okay, I the way that I think about this question, and sorry, I keep changing my answers, but I've been thinking about this more. That's fine, so, that's great. So this question is one of those false dichotomy questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and false dichotomy means is should we take this route or this route when there actually aren't, they aren't really separate things. Um, and the same can be, you know, in, in marketing, this is very common. You know, you ask, Hey, is, is brand more important or revenue more important or customer success more important or new sales more important. But in reality, when we get to, to work 
and to get to our jobs, we can't choose one or the other. You have to do both. Um, and effectiveness and efficiency are, you know, just like you defined it, Vivian, effectiveness is, are we getting the result we want? And then efficiency is, are we doing it with as little waste as possible? And mm -hmm. instead of either or, you actually do it in a cycle. So mm -hmm. you first determine, okay, are we getting the results that we want? Are we getting the engagements, the conversion, and the downstream pipeline metrics that move the needle for the business? Is that in place? And then now we scale it and repeat it um, so that we get even more of those results um, without having to use too many resources. And that's really the secret of scaling. Um, mm -hmm. And then after a while, you'll see, you know, as many of you seen, this sort of law of diminishing returns where the same campaign doesn't produce the stuff that you want. So you revisit it again. You revisit your assumptions of this is the right message. These are the right channels. This is the right offer. And then you test, then you determine what now is effective and then you do it again. So it's actually a cycle um, mm -hmm. versus a you know divergent path. And um, that you should, good marketing ops th teams think of both all the time. Oh, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Any, any other comments from our other panelists on that idea of a cycle between effectiveness and efficiency? I think Daryl's point of it being a false dichotomy is actually really good because when I was initially answering this question, I felt a little trapped, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, everyone felt like Vivian was playing a trick on us and forcing <laughs> us to make a choice. Um, so I was trying to hedge my bet, you know, with, you know, you want what you do to be effective, but you mm -hmm. want to be efficient about it. And uh, Daryl took the, the path that I couldn't see and said, it's a bad choice if you can do both. Yeah. yeah don't, let, don't let them trick you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's really interesting. And I feel like even my early discussions with Jessica, I remember her saying there is a time to focus on one versus the other. So I'm sure our panelists all can agree on that. And they were all tricked by the false dichotomy created by me. Okay, so let's move on to the with that with that, let's move on to the next question. Um, so here's a few more survey results for us. Uh, we asked people which Marketo capabilities have the greatest impact on business growth. And these were the three um, that were ranked at the top. Um, well, if you if we go if you go into our report, we actually do have data on like which capabilities people plan to start using and which ones they plan to continue using. But we thought that it might be the most interesting for the sake of discussion, which are the top three in terms of business impact. Um, so the first one being experience automation, which we define as dynamically nurturing customers and scoring engagement through every journey stage. The second one is data environment. So that's about enriching and segmenting AI powered audiences using integrated profiles and engagement history. Um, and finally, impact analytics. So proving and improving impact together with sales using multi-touch attribution across every touch point. Um, so my question for our experts is, uh, which Marketo capabilities do you think are most critical for business growth? Do you agree or disagree with the survey results? Um, I'm going to point to Jessica again because I haven't heard from her in a while. Um, I really liked this question, and I, I definitely think a lot of the results that are in the actual survey are also really insightful. I think the top three for me really boil down to creating incredible experiences for your prospects and customers. And uh, uh, they all kind of work in tandem. So you need the right data about where your customer, customers and prospects are in their journey with your company to uh, build and automate beautiful experiences for them. And so those two really tie back together and kind of the way you get and prioritize some of that is by proving the impact of all of those things. Um, and so I think that really boils down to making sure that all of your systems and um, platforms are speaking together and to each other and powering uh, data kind of the way you report on it. I think the other thing or the other point I wanted to bring up with the data orchestration uh, piece is I think we're moving into a really interesting time. And, you know, we've all seen the, the cookie list future and the deprecation of things Google is doing and and one thing I think that MOPS pros can start planning for is how do we 
build experiences that people want to engage with and give us the first party data about their engagement with us to power some of those other things and rely less on uh, third party and, and less personalized data. Mm -hmm. Really great points. Um, Daryl, what do you think makes, which Marketo capabilities are most critical in your opinion? Yeah, okay, so the way that I think about this is it looks like from the survey, it looks like automation is on the top, data management is in the middle, and then reporting is the third one. Well, these are um, the top three. There's some that come kind of further down beneath them. So these are only the top three. Just those to, are the top three, right? Those are yeah, the top yeah. Three. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So my take is that Marketo plus marketing automation. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean Marketo. I think the most valuable thing that it actually offered us was this idea of a workflow. So sometimes it's called business automation. In Marketo, it's smart campaigns and smart lists. And um, when you first use that tool or whatever tool that you have, you realize, you quickly realize that it's not really like features of a tool. It's more of a visual simplified version of programming. So you are actually coding if then statements. And then in the smart list, you're actually querying the database, um, which by the way, um, is was actually modeled off of, of SQL, SQL. So, so the smart lists are querying the database and then the smart campaigns are running if then statements. That's the most powerful marketing automation feature. And it's because it allows you to design the customer experience that you want and that the customers want, both from an external customer standpoint, right? We can trigger automated emails. We can, um, you know, uh, create pop-ups. We can we can trigger SMS campaigns, whatever. We, we can personalize their, their experience. And then it also allows you to personalize the internal customer's experience, which is usually sales, uh, mm -hmm. customer success, your marketing stakeholders, right? They have the leads that they want. It's enriched with the data that they want. It's scored in a way so that they have intelligence to make their, to, to have productive sales conversations. And this is the heart really of, of marketing automation. It's, it's we, the builders, have the tools to now go beyond whatever sort of out of the box things that, that the, the vendors provide. And we design something that's very custom and very bespoke. Um, and that, that I think is the, the, the best feature that, that marketing automation platforms, especially the enterprise ones have. Can I just mm -hmm. say that what Daryl said is like very profound. And I only learned this a few years ago um, when David Kreider presented at San Francisco Marketo user group. And he was like, if you're using Marketo, you're a programmer. And I was like, what? And it's oh, yes. Daryl like totally hit it on the nose. You're using SQL, which is like a mm -hmm. very standard database if you like want to learn more about relational databases and you know the statements that go with them and the more you learn about programming the more you can actually be a better marketo user um you can like think about the best ways to build your smart list most efficiently if you understand um courtney grimes has a couple of articles on this about like how to build your smart list if you have complex smart lists like which statements to put higher in order to like make the database query faster um, and you can learn more about like how Marketo is built under the hood. There's so much nerdiness. Um, and you can also think about scaling. You can use this concept called dry methodology, which means don't repeat yourself. And the opposite of dry is wet, which is right every time. And basically like that's what your operational programs are doing, right? Like you don't have lead scoring in every single webinar. You have lead scoring in one central program that gets triggered when a webinar happens, when gated content happens. Um, so I could talk about this all day. I just, for those of you, like this, this is a super important concept. Maybe we should have a whole webinar about it because I just, I think that's really one of the most powerful things about marketing. Yeah, and, and just, just right. one point, yeah, because yeah. And then I think Amy really nailed it on the head. This is why too, it's so difficult to replace marketing ops talent because mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to replace someone's sort of structured thinking, you know what I mean? They created this and it's completely different than someone else's, you know what I mean? So, so um, 
that's kind of the the cause, one of the causes too of the the mar the marketing ops talent crisis, so to speak, because your companies think that they want people to just come in and fix the configuration of the tools, like anyone can do that. But in reality, we've sort of you know architected entire journeys on this platform. And we've done it how we think it, it, it should be done. And that might, might, that might not be uh, the same as someone else kind of coming in, you know, not, not like, um, you know, there's a lot of very standard. If you look at project management tools, if you look at advertising tools, there's like a, a, a best way to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But with, with a lot of enterprise marketing automation, it, there's not one single way there's, it's a, it, it should be very flexible, very bespoke. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to, to call that out just in case people were wondering, whoa, why is it so hard to hire marketing ops people? Why is it so hard to replace who we've lost? This is mm -hmm. one of the reasons. Wow. That's, that uh, you mentioned that, Daryl, and that's such a big piece in consulting, too, is if you think about consultants and the number of accounts that you work in, where each instance is set up completely differently with completely different goals in mind. Um, you know, to anybody that's been in consulting or considered it, it's it's a great way to get numerous at bats all at once in different structures and tool stacks and goals. But to your point, yeah, a lot of times these organizations are trying to replace people who took that institutional knowledge with them and where it may not have been well documented. Um, and so whoever comes in next is trying to first get their arms around what's there and, and figure that piece out before then they can do anything with it. Wow. So this is an incredibly insightful and deep conversation. Um, almost like building this image of like the idea of like a high priest of marketing automation, but I, <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. Uh, but since you brought up the topic of consultants, Brooke, let's ask our consultant who is on the call, Paul, because uh, certainly like like Daryl has said, and I totally agree, um, it, it does need to be bespoken based on the situation. Um, but Paul, I'm sure you do have a way to kind of systematize the questions that need to be answered and things that need to be built, right? In order to create that in a Marketo instance. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, Brooke and other people with consulting experience are going to absolutely agree here documentation is just so key. Um, it is it is everything, you know, and as consultants, um, anyone with consulting experience can see this or remembers this or, you know, as a current consultant. Um, it, it's two-pronged. Um, going into new instances constantly, you have to get very good at, um, to borrow a metaphor from the chat, digging in like archeologically, digging in mm -hmm. and seeing how things have been setting up and learning um, that, and then making sure that you're conforming a little bit to that, making sure you're not throwing anything totally out of left field at them and coming out of this world. Um, but also when, you know, when you're done, you wanna make sure that the docu documentation you leave behind is complete, and it's going to allow people to understand totally what you've built and why you've built it and the reasoning behind that. Um, because, you know, we don't want to leave people with some programs that work great until they don't. And then they don't understand <laughs> why it's not working and why, why this was done that way. So it's so key to have, you know, the great documentation processes that we do have and to be able to leave those behind. Um, Going into the, the original question here of, you know, why Marketo is just so well suited for the enterprise. Um, I mean, some of it's been addressed before, right? Uh, we have the um, powers of the smart campaigns, like Daryl said, um, and then the, you know, SQL-like environment where you can dynamically filter uh, through the database, through smart lists and you know the smart lists and smart campaigns and email programs, you don't have to import a list for every effort. Uh, you can have repeatable lists that will capture new newly qualified records. Um, and then again, on the theme of repeatability, right? It's so valuable, the ability to use tokens and templates to set up these repeatable, um, uh, 
well, templates, but <laughs> these repeatable <laughs> templates, don't repeat yourself, right? You have a template, you clone it, maybe tweak the tokens as you need to, and then you're ready. And that's you know something we can see with Jetto where uh, we have an automated process for that. And we can go through and utilize um, that software engine. Uh, and so just everyone's brought up great points. Don't repeat yourself, document everything. Um, yeah, that's where I wanna leave it, I guess. Great. Paul, you touched on one thing that I just want to like shout from the rooftops, which is the why aspect of documentation. Mm -hmm. I think so many people focus on the this is how I built it, um, and this is exactly the way things are configured. But when you inherit a new instance or join a new team, what is often missing is the critical business context, and including the that context in documentation uh, will save a lot of people a lot of time. I saw a great post somewhere that was like. Uh, the highlight of success for a marketing ops pro would be that if you left your current company, the person who replaced you would seek you out to message you thank you for the documentation that you left them. Um, and that really resonated with me. Mm, beautiful. All right. Uh, we only have one question to go. We'll try to cover it fast so that we can save time for audience questions. Um, so one interesting finding we had was even though measuring impact is very important for Marketo users, only 35% of respondents are currently using an attribution platform. And of those, the most commonly used one is Visible. So my question, my final question of the day, um, are attribution tools necessary uh, for measuring impact? And when do you know if your team is ready to use one? Uh, let's get started with Paul this time. Okay. Um, big that depends. Uh, there's a big, big depends there. Uh, you know, attribution tools bring you the ability to do a more complex model. Uh, Marketo can do some first touch and last touch, but Visible is really a lot better with the multi-touch and getting a more complete picture, you know, because it's very unlikely that uh, there really is a single touch point that was meaningful in um, in a records entering to your system, it's much more likely that it was an amalgamation of touch points um, as opposed to that single initiative. However, it could probably be argued that not everyone needs complex attribution. Um, Daryl mentioned something earlier in the webinar uh, at the beginning, I think it was question one, uh, marketing wanting to claim credit versus create value. And so, and this also depends a bit on company culture, right? So if your culture is cooperation and maybe you don't always have the resources to focus on the deep um, you know, analysis of the touch points that, and the lead journey, but you can prove that you are creating that value by providing those records um, to sales and pushing them down the funnel, right? Then maybe you don't need to concern yourself so much with the um, complex attribution model. On the other hand, maybe you know you want to be able to keep track of every point, or maybe you know you find yourself fighting for a little bit of budget, and it's really going to help you out to be able to point to every little um, every touch point that did contribute. And like we said earlier today, uh, you don't have to spend money on things that aren't working for you. Then you can only focus on or really focus on the ones that are and uh, streamline and save yourself a little time and money and get to the end result better. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, Brooke, what, do you have anything to add to that as a follow-up to what Paul said or a different perspective? Yeah, I think mine's a little different perspective. Um, we actually use Caliber Mind as our attribution tool. We, we chose that because I wanted something that would be external to Salesforce and not so heavily reliant on Salesforce campaign membership. Um, so we actually have an instance of Caliber Mind. Uh, in some ways, it's a bit like a CDP. It pulls all of its data onto Google BigQuery. Um, and so for us, we're in the process of hooking that up to things like Snowflake and Tableau. But it's hooked up not only to our Marketo instance and Salesforce, it's got a first party cookie on our website. And it is also integrated to be able to pull data for outreach, uh, for seismic, 
and we're pulling in our Sixth Sense and Google Analytics data. And so for us, it's not just entirely about marketing attribution. Um, we're starting to expand that to look at a little more, you know, full funnel customer journey analytics and bringing in all of those touch points. So we're kind of moving into that next step above and beyond just the marketing attribution piece. No, certainly the marketing attribution piece is great for our teams to see where marketing dollars are moving the needle. Um, like just about every organization, we struggle with things like contact roles on campaigns and the connections that happen there. So if you look in Salesforce and try to say something about marketing campaigns, impact or influence on pipeline, you have a very incomplete picture in Salesforce. We see a lot more over in Caliber Mind, and we're able to use that to make decisions about what events we do or what partners we invest our time in or how we look at our marketing campaigns and our audiences so that we can spend our dollars more wisely. It's mm -hmm. less about the quote unquote credit piece um, and also looked at more as an art versus a science. There's always going to be things that you're not going to be able to attribute, right? People block cookies, they move devices. Um, you know, there's, there's things that happen along the way. It's never going to be 100% perfect. So it's not a, it's not a true science, but it can still help you with how you make decisions and how you look at your marketing campaigns. And I think as long as you look through it with that lens, there's a lot of value to be had in it. Mm hmm. Um, Amy, would you have anything to add to Brooke and Paul's perspectives on attribution? Yeah, I heavily agree with both of them. And I think, you know, what you really need to make sure is you have cross-functional executive buy-in. You can spend money on an attribution tool and you can spend the time setting it up. But if leadership doesn't understand it or is not bought in, you have wasted a lot of your time and resources. Uh, ask me because I've been there. <laughs> Just make sure everybody's on the same page before you dive in. Great. Um, any comments from Brooke? I mean, not Brooke, Daryl or Jessica, because you haven't, and then we can jump into the Q&A because we're running out of time. If yeah, you don't. Yeah, one, one comment on attribution. To me, attribution is something that, that the marketing team uses like almost personally um, because, you know, there's marketing contribution, which is, hey, how, how much impact is, is marketing having on the business? Attribution is of all the programs we're doing, you know, which one's performing better, which one, where are we allocating um, our results to? And this helps us improve our decision making. But other people, external teams may not understand the methodology that we're using to do that. You know, um, they may not understand, oh, is it a linear attribution model? Is it a W? Is it a, is it, is it a U model? So it's not really helpful to like to shove attribution in everyone's face because they won't, they probably won't really get it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I would personally use it as, you know, like your own personal tracking. And I think that one thing that I'll, I'll kind of recommend, this is, this is my personal opinion. You're usually ready for attribution when your marketing is scaling and you, you continue to do better and better. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you're trying to like bring in to fix your bad marketing. I wouldn't do it that way. A lot of teams make that mistake of like, well, our marketing's not doing well because we don't have attribution. That that doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, I, I could speak longer on that one, but yeah, that's a little little tip there. So, sorry, this is. Let me. How do you know how to fix your marketing without better knowledge of attribution? Since you're saying that they need to know quite well how they're doing, they, they need to be doing quite well before they start working on attribution. So, look at. Yeah, so so you can still see without attribution what results your campaigns are doing, right? So mm -hmm. like like bring it, moving leads from the top of the funnel to the bottom, improving conversion rates across each of the different stages, and creating excellent top of the funnel events like like this one that are like awareness based, where you get a lot of engagement. You don't need an attribution tool for that. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm saying is a lot of teams will say our marketing is not good, so we're going to buy an attribution tool to fix it. And that, mm -hmm. that paradigm, that mindset is not correct. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yep. Okay, great. Well, we have some audience questions. Do you, if any of you need to jump off, totally understandable. We are at the top of the hour. 
Um, but I mean, to quickly recap the discussion, um, so I think the conclusions we've kind of tentatively arrived at are that the real challenge behind measuring impact is actually an alignment challenge. Um, also that effectiveness and efficiency are really both important parts of a cycle of improving marketing performance. Um, and that um, your marketing, your marketo needs to be configured to sort of meet your needs. And it's almost kind of like a proxy for programming. Um, and that it seems that you need to reach a certain level of maturity in your marketing before you start delving into attribution, which can be quite a complex project. Um, so with that in mind, feel free to keep asking your questions in the Q&A if you'd like. Oh, Amy has to jump by. Amy, thank you. She might be gone already. Um, but here's for those who are able to stay on. One question was, why are marketers trying to prove impact? Are we thinking about this the wrong way? That is a spicy question. Who wants to take that one? Why are marketers trying to prove impact? Is this the wrong way of thinking about it? I feel like we kind of touched on this. I, I'll kick that one off. I think mm -hmm. the, the concept of proving impact comes from sort of the historic view of marketing being a cost center um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a revenue generator. And so in a lot of ways, as organizations continue to ask for more resources, more budget, you have the business side of the house looking for a reason why. So that is where more and more of this proving of impact, whether that's through marketing sourced pipeline, marketing influenced pipeline, and a responsibility that marketing has to demonstrate how those dollars are being spent and that they're not just, hey, we, we took a pile of dollars and lit them on fire in the backyard type of thing, that we did wow. something with these to drive the business forward. Um, I think more and more as you get very data focused marketers moving up, moving into the C-suite, having a seat at the, at the table and speaking in terms of the business, that's where marketing is really being asked to prove that impact. And so I think that there's, there's certainly value um, in those conversations and being able to track and report and manage the data. I think that's certainly where a lot of this uh, significant growth in marketing operations has occurred over the last you know, 10, but especially the last five years is as that has changed and marketers are being tasked to prove that impact, you need people in there that can understand data integrations, how these systems talk, how to report and how to have those revenue-based conversations. Mm -hmm. That's really a great answer. Um, I'll move on to the next one. So the next one says, I'm looking to launch Marketo at a startup next month. Any learnings or recommendations? a fresh Marketo setup for a startup. I feel like the first one is like, don't, what's the word? Don't hack, like don't, uh, what did Amy say at some point? Don't like, be scrappy. Don't be scrappy, which is, I mean, what, what's, what, what are, what do we think? What are the recommendations for someone looking to launch Marketo at a startup? Get help, <laughs> get help. Get help, okay. From Amy's a nod from Brooke. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other more co concretely, let's say you are the help right now because they're asking you. So what would be your top three recommendations? Get help. I would, <laughs> I would say do things intentionally. Mm -hmm. So like even, even though you're just starting out, make sure you have reasons for doing things and try, try and look a little bit past the immediate now. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that can be hard when when you're scrambling and trying not to be scrappy but uh you want to make sure that you're putting down a solid foundation mm -hmm. all right okay we're i'll ask one last because i really don't want to keep our experts on for too long um so one that just came in any tip to transmit to other departments the importance of data health and standardization to drive better results how do you communicate that value So yeah, yeah, I can, I can, for, for this one, um, you actually want to start not at database health, you want to start at business outcomes. So one is um, reporting and then targeting and segmentation are always big, really um, um, big drivers for the business. If you can segment your campaigns better, that means you're targeting better. That means your campaigns are going to people that find your 
message more relevant. They're more likely to convert and you can kind of go all the way down the funnel. Um, and then the reporting is something that business executives and leadership need to see in order to better manage their investment. Um, that's not possible without good data or credible data or complete data. So if you have data that's incomplete, um, redundant, duplicate and unstructured, none of those things is really possible. Um, so I would use that to like ladder up your data needs to the business outcomes that they're looking to do downstream. Hmm. Oh, that's a really great uh, perspective. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We'll be sending out the recording uh, right after this. Um, thank you to our great panelists for taking the time out of their very busy days to share their expertise. Um, I hope you all have a great week and hope to see you at the next one. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.